My name is Raquel and um, I'm 33 years old with um, terminal colorectal cancer. And um, I feel like that has been such a huge part of my life that I have to remind myself that there's other parts outside of that. So um, I currently work in the tech industry. I'm very blessed to be able to do so. And um, in my spare time, I really like reading. I like drawing, I'm very artistic. And um, very recently I've been posting more on Social media is where I've been finding great connections with other people going through the same thing as me. So to go back to the beginning of when I first started noticing symptoms of my colorectal cancer, I would say it was 2019. And during that time, I was living with a roommate who's my best friend, and she started to notice how often I was going to the bathroom. Um, at the time, I was working in restaurant management, and so I figured... I'm probably eating too much of the food at work or I'm eating too many processed foods. And um, I started eating higher protein. I started changing my diet, trying to eat healthier, but also using like um, fiber supplements. I figured I wasn't eating enough fiber. And I feel like that's one of the first things you kind of read about online about how to resolve like diarrhea or like um, bowel issues. Um, and I found that that did help. You know, um, I found that the symptoms did go away. But they would come back to, um, you know, plague me again in 2022. And um, that's when I was working as a contractor in the tech industry. And um, I made really good friends with um, other people on my team. And um, one of them noticed how often I was going to the bathroom. And she said, Raquel, are you OK? And I said, yeah, I feel like I'm fine. Like, I, I feel like maybe it's the dairy in my coffee. Um, maybe I have a gluten sensitivity. <laughs> At the time, I wasn't really concerned, um, and I kind of just wrote myself off. I dismissed my symptoms, um, but knowing what I know now, I was having the classic colorectal cancer symptoms. So the colorectal cancer symptoms that I personally experienced, um, off the top of my head, it's going to be the frequent bowel movements. And then also the um, pin thin stools is a classic sign of colorectal cancer. Um, in addition, like any kind of blood that's in your stool is a huge red flag. It means something is wrong. And based on the color of it, kind of like pinpoints where exactly that bleed is. So whether it's dark or mild red, for me, it was like mild red. I didn't have heavy bleeding, which is why I thought like it might have been okay that there wasn't something really wrong. Um, but another classic sign is like getting really full quickly after eating. And that was definitely like a huge the red flag that something was wrong because that happened from me from like 2022 to like when I got diagnosed in May of 2023. It just, I feel like my digestive system was probably just under so much stress just from the cancer and I would later find out that um, the cause of some of my bloating was from um, the medical term is ascites. So when you have cancer that is as advanced as mine, um, especially like with colorectal cancer, that those tumors start secreting like a free fluid. And so I was actually actively dieting, um, trying to lose a couple pounds before my uh, diagnosis. But despite how healthy I was eating, I could not lose weight. Um, and I thought it was strange. Like, why is my stomach so round and so hard? Well, when I got diagnosed, I found out that I had about a gallon of ascites fluid in my stomach that they had to drain. And immediately, like, that relieved so many symptoms I was having with eating. Um, so that is something that you can get when cancer is metastatic and advanced. Um, and I'm trying to think, I would say that those were the worst symptoms. And, and I want to reiterate again, any kind of blood in your stool is a huge red flag. Pay attention to it. And um, the reason why I didn't take it more seriously is because the symptoms would come and then they would like go for a while. So I feel like it's important to note, you know, as a millennial, I feel like, um, and I have st statistically looked into this, that like half of us don't have a primary care provider. And that was the story of my 20s. 
Um, and I was really fortunate and blessed to land a permanent role in the tech industry where I had good health care. And I was able to schedule like my first physical in like 10 years um, back in May of 2023. And um, when you don't go to the doctor for that long, there is a lot to talk about. And so I was letting my primary care physician know all of my symptoms, um, especially like my bowel symptoms, and that somewhat recently I had had severe abdominal pain, um, abdominal pain that was full, like abdominal, like it wasn't just one spot and that it felt like it was very abnormal. And when I was talking to her about this, I could kind of tell that she thought it was kind of in my head and she um, actually scheduled me a psychiatric appointment after my physical um, because she thought I just had anxiety. But um, like I said, now that I know so much about my own disease, I know that they were classic colorectal cancer symptoms. But because I'm so young, like I'm just 33, I'm a woman, I'm a minority, um, statistically speaking, like to even just have one of those categories um, is going to make you more likely to be dismissed in a medical setting. And that is absolutely what I had experienced. And um, it was maybe three weeks after that physical that my cancer was found um, completely metastatic, just spread all over in the ER. And I know that she probably felt some guilt because after my diagnosis in the ER, they send that information to my primary care provider until um, I end up being um, assigned to like an oncologist. That's typically how it works. And um, I'm sure once she saw just how bad it was that she felt guilt at the same time, I'm sure she's not the only doctor who has done that. Um, Cause when you're young and especially like um, medical doctors, they're being taught these statistics of like colorectal cancer is an older person's disease. It's something that happens to you when you're in your fifties, maybe. Um, they're not going to see somebody like me who visually looks very healthy um, and who's so young and think cancer, right? So I don't necessarily blame her. But at the same time, this like dismissal of people who are like me, I feel like is widespread because I know I'm not alone. Like, but when I did finally go to the ER, um, I remember that day just so clearly um, when I got diagnosed with my cancer, um, I had s severe abdominal pain that was migrating to my lower back and I almost fainted in my apartment. And um, then my intuition was saying, something's really wrong, Raquel, go to the doctor. And so I went to the ER and I know that they had done a full blood panel on me, which included um, CEA and um, CA125 and like CA19, which are all cancer markers. And mine were just absolutely elevated. Like my CEA alone was like in the 700s, which anything above 30 is already like a sign of like um, kind of cancer activity in your body. So for mine to be that high, you know, it means that my cancer was so advanced. I feel like um, when I was in um, the ER that um, they took me really seriously. And I feel like that's why my cancer was found. Like the doctor knew something was wrong. And um, she did that blood panel. I had an, um, I've had an MRI done. Um, a CT scan, and then also um, ultrasound. And um, they did those tests like immediately, like right away in the beginning of my diagnosis. So when I went to the ER, the um, ER doctor actually told me that I had um, ovarian cancer because that's where they found it first. So um, in the CT scan that they took of me, they found that the cancer was pretty advanced on my ovaries and in my liver. But it wouldn't be until I had um, a liver biopsy that they would find the primary source of my cancer, which was colorectal. And um, I wouldn't find in, until a little bit later just like how incredibly it advanced. So um, my personal metastases are like in my colon, my ovaries, um, my liver, my lungs, 
my peritoneal cavity and omentum, which those are not terms I'm sure most people are used to hearing. So it's essentially just like all of my abdominal lining uh, is where like my cancer is and where they found it through those tests within like, like a week. Um, it happened so fast and I feel um, truly blessed that my, um, that when I went to the ER, that like my cancer and what type of cancer was like diagnosed so quickly. I feel like that just kudos to the hospital that I went to, that they took me very seriously, that they ran all these tests in the ER, found my cancer, um, that they immediately referred me to an oncologist. And like next day I was talking to an oncologist and then that oncologist like referred me to my liver biopsy. And a couple days later I had it and they found the primary source of my cancer. So I feel like even though it's very, very unfortunate how late my cancer was found, um, just what an incredible experience that was for them to just like take me so seriously and find out like what was going on. I feel like um, in regards to like finding out how I felt about my diagnosis, I don't think I had the reaction that maybe like a normal person would have. And I feel like that's because um, I've had a lot of things happen in my life and um, I am definitely the type of person that has like a very calm demeanor when it comes to like when things go wrong. Like I'm your go-to person to like think logically about it. And that's literally how I processed um, my cancer diagnosis in the ER. And even the doctor seemed like really surprised that she's like, Raquel, like you're not even crying. I'm so sorry. Like this is I'm not telling you good news. And I said, you know what? It's okay because no matter what happens, I'm going to get through it. Like I just feel like so much confidence that whether I can heal from this or whether I don't, like I'm going to be able to to handle it well. Like it'll be okay because I've overcome other things in my life. And um, I hope that maybe I can be a bit of an inspiration for people who are struggling um, I feel like everything's going to be okay. And I told myself that even in the beginning of my diagnosis. When it comes to treatment of my colorectal cancer, so I have personally found that it really depends on like your hospital, the type of protocol that they're going to want to approach for your diagnosis. Um, when I first got diagnosed, I was actually with a different hospital and for insurance purposes had to switch to a different one. Um, but I feel like my um, treatments would have been a little bit different if I would have stayed with that first initial hospital because they wanted to just start um, surgeries right away. Like they said, you're going to have a full hysterectomy. Um, I'm going to be doing this in um, collaboration with one of our like very renowned liver surgeons. And we're going to do this at the same time. But then when I switched over to a different hospital, they told me, we're going to focus on chemotherapy. So let's see how you react to chemotherapy, shrink what we can, and then talk about surgery. And I understand the reasonings for that because um, they want to shrink as much as they can to um, lessen, I guess, like um, things going wrong during surgery or make it a little bit less risky. Um, so... Because of that, because I I ended up switching hospitals, um, I've just been primarily, I've been chemotherapy. With my chemotherapy, um, I first started with like um, exaloplatin. I think it is a really like common like chemotherapy med medication. And, and um, <clears throat> the side effects are not pleasant. It causes you like neuropathy, cold sensitivity. And so... Um, Fortunately for me, we stopped that in December. So I was only on it for about like six months until like I was really starting to feel like the side effects were, were affecting my quality of life too much. Um, but that's a very common one. And now I have switched over to like, um, I believe it's the 5FU and the Arena TCAN. And the reason why we're introducing the Arena TCAN is to see if that's going to help um, like my liver metastases. Because so far, I am having a mixed response to chemotherapy. 
Um, my liver and lung metastases like aren't responding to chemo, but the metastases and like my my ovaries and also um, like my colon are responding moderately well. So um, just I guess me and my oncologist are trying to see like what combination could maybe help with wherever else my cancer is. Um, so I don't really have a choice as of right now. Um, chemotherapy is actually keeping me alive. Um, so um, I'm going to continue being on it strictly biweekly. And um, also 50% of like people who have chemotherapy um, might need what's called like granic shots. So your white blood cell count gets so low with chemotherapy that you need other medications to boost your white blood cells to continue treatment. I unfortunately fall under that category. So not only do I have my chemotherapy, but I have to have those shots to even have chemotherapy because my white blood cells get too low. And right now they're telling me that they don't even want to do surgery just because of like how incredibly advanced my cancer is. They're saying that it might not be worth it. However, I personally have read and have seen from other people with colorectal cancer that they have better survivability with surgery because the more cancer that is in your body, it gives it more opportunities to spread and be aggressive. So I am actually very actively looking to find um, and get second opinions from hospitals that are willing to like touch me and like get some of this out because I know it would help me in the long run. But I will be traveling to get a second opinion at MD Anderson and Sloan, hoping that they can do surgery on me which will help extend my life. And even though I know it's risky, I'm, I'm willing to do it because the alternative is just be on chemo forever, you know. My last message and advice for people is um, listen to your intuition because you know your body more than anybody else. A medical professional is diagnosing you based off of, you know, generalities, but you know yourself better than anybody so if you are having these problems, please feel validated that you deserve to go to a GI specialist, go to a specialist, get a second opinion. Don't just listen to the first doctor, you know, get opinions from like a second or a third, especially if your symptoms are persistent. I feel like that's the biggest thing. Your symptoms are persistent and they aren't going away. Something is wrong. Um, and especially blood in your stool. 100% go to a GI specialist. Like, that should never be written off. Um, you deserve to be listened to, and you deserve to be taken seriously in a medical setting. And if the first doctor isn't taking you seriously, all it takes is just the one. It takes the one who is going to listen to you and who wants to help you, and they're out there. We just have to find them. And um, even if a medical professional, I know as much as we want to, like, 100% you know, trust they have like our best interests, like they went to medical school or highly intelligent. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't sometimes wrong. You know, that doesn't mean that they don't also make mistakes or sometimes misdiagnose. So um, go out there and fight for yourself and fight for your health. And I hope everybody who hears my story feels very validated to go in and seek help. <laughs>